Father, we thank you. We can sing that song from our hearts, that we can come before you with worship and praise and adoration. Thank you that you're a great and holy, righteous, loving God. There is no one like thee. We praise you. You've come to us, made yourself known to us. We might be reconciled to you and live as your children. Thank you for your spirit and your word. May your spirit speak to us through that word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last night, Joni and I were visiting in the home of some friends, and they very graciously gave me a gift that I think was inspired by the sermon last Sunday, and I'd like to share it with you. I think you might appreciate it as much as, as, as I did. For those of you who may wonder what inspired the gift, I suggest you purchase the tape of last Sunday morning's service. I should also add that this is not going to be a new line of designer t-shirts that we'll be selling in our stores. I'm not exactly sure when I'll wear it either. In a recent issue of Christianity Today magazine, I was, as I was glancing through it, there was the, the title of one of the articles caught my attention because it was appeared that it was going to be dealing with a subject about which I've had some questions. The article was by a Christian author by the name of Phil Yancey, and the title of the article was, Is the Midlife Crisis a Phony? And he went on to say the following in the article. He says, if I hear the term midlife crisis one more time, I may have one. <laughs> the phrase expands in common parlance to encompass any struggles of the soul that occur between the ages of 31 and 55. And if love covers a multitude of sins, the redoubtable midlife crisis disguises a multitude of the same. People no longer commit adultery and break up their marriages. They go through midlife crises. I've heard the same monologue from so many of my male friends that I'm contemplating printing up cue cards to save them the trouble of having to formulate rationalizations. The code words, which seem to occur whether the marriage has lasted five or 15 years, go like this. I have changed. I'm a different man today than when I married her. I must be true to myself and follow who I really am as far as that leads me. I can see why I used to love her, but I'm now bound to follow my new dreams and expectations which she simply cannot fulfill. Often a hormonal complication comes out during the conversation, a deep abiding attraction to another woman who truly understands me, who usually happens to be 10 years younger and 15 pounds lighter than the wife and untrammeled with the responsibilities of motherhood. The husband plays out the scenario with great earnestness, his facial muscles expressing the blend of deep pain and poignancy over a force bigger than I that I simply cannot resist. I do my best to follow the wise listener, to follow the wise listener rules of keeping quiet and nodding sympathetically. I try not to flinch when I hear that this experience is wholly unexpected and unique possibly something new in the history of the world. Now, I think it's probably true to say that most Christians would agree that the Bible uh, does indeed teach that marriage was instituted by God, that the idea of marriage was conceived in heaven, and that marriage belongs to God. Most would probably also agree that God uh, desires that marriage be regulated by his commandments, that he's communicated to us from heaven the instructions for marriage. Most Christians would agree with that in the general sense, but I think there are those who, like the people mentioned here in this article, that when troubles begin to appear in their marriage, that when they face some marital difficulties, 
then there's a sort of rationalization or a rationalizing process that goes on that says, well, those instructions, that idea of marriage in general certainly is true, but this situation is unique. These problems that I'm encountering in my marriage don't, aren't really covered by everything God says. And I know that if God had had in mind the sorts of things that I'm facing, he wouldn't have expected anyone to live by the commandments, the instructions he's given for marriage. Therefore, I'm justified, given the circumstances that I'm facing, given the difficulties and the problems that have come up in the marriage that I didn't expect, I'm justified in dissolving this marriage and beginning something new, starting all over again with a fresh relationship. That the general idea that God has given in Scripture doesn't really apply to my particular situation. Well, it seems to me that the Bible doesn't only speak about marriage in general as being instituted by God, but I think the Bible also is very plain and it makes, tells us that individual marriages are confirmed by heaven. That God doesn't simply speak about marriages, but he speaks about individual marriages. And that each marriage, when it is entered into, is confirmed by God himself and stands in relationship to him and is responsible to him. Jesus said so in Matthew 19 in verses 4 through 6 when he reminded us that whom God hath joined together let no man part asunder. He says what God has joined together that God is party to the wedding vows. And therefore, every single marriage is confirmed by heaven. We find the same thing in Malachi 2.14, when it speaks about the covenant relationship between a husband and wife. And it points out very clearly, he says, because the Lord was witness to come to the covenant between you and the wife of your youth. And so the Bible makes it very, very plain that each marriage stands before God and is confirmed by God as being something that now is responsible to him. Now, it's true to say, I think, that not every marriage is entered into because of the will of God. I'm not sure that every Christian young person or older person contemplating marriage has necessarily sought the will of God. I trust that most, if maybe not all, do. But there are those cases maybe where they haven't really sought the will of the Lord. And, of course, non-Christians wouldn't seek the will of God. So it's true to say that not every marriage is entered into because of the will of God. But I think that we have good biblical reason to say that any marriage into, entered into becomes the will of God. That once a person is married, that marriage state is now God's will for that person's life. Now, I think we have good reason for saying that because the Bible says that adultery is sin, and adultery is the violation of the marriage covenant. And it doesn't only apply to Christians, it applies to non-Christians because God tells us that an adulterer will not enter into heaven. You cannot live in adultery and be part of the kingdom of Jesus. And so, just as a non-Christian is responsible not to steal or not to lie, and God holds him accountable if he does. So a non-Christian is also responsible not to commit adultery. He is responsible to remain faithful within that marriage bond because each marriage is in fact confirmed from heaven. Each legitimate marriage is confirmed from heaven. Most of us have probably read the book the Christmas Carol, or you may have seen the play uh, by Charles Dickens. And you may recall near the beginning of the story, Scrooge is in his office, he's counting his money, and his nephew Fred pays him a visit. And Fred 
has come to invite Scrooge to his home for Christmas and to meet his new bride. And, Stru and Scrooge, very grumpily, very ungraciously said, why did you get married? Now, that's a very important question. It's, it's a question that each of us who, uh, who is married ought to ask himself. Why did I get married? And if you're contemplating marriage, you ought to ask yourself, why am I getting married? Why am I marrying the person I'm planning on marrying? It's an important question because the Bible tells us there are basically only two answers to that particular question because there are only two reasons why people get married. And we find the answer to that in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from unchastity, that each one of you know how to take a wife for himself in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like heathen who do not know God. It seems to me that Paul is saying in Thessalonians that basically there are two kinds of people who marry, and they marry for two reasons, basically. The first kind are the counterfeiters, those who marry simply out of lust. They marry in order to satisfy a felt human need apart from God. I believe that these marriages are counterfeit because, first of all, the reasons for marrying are wrong. The reason, basically, why the people Paul refers to as the heathen, the reason they marry is simply out of desire, selfish desire, uh, to find something in the other person that will satisfy some felt human need apart from a relationship to God. Now, the key problem behind most marital difficulties, the key uh, thing that creates most marital problems is that each partner is looking to the other to meet his or her needs. That problem lies at the base of almost every problem in marriage. That these two people have married with the hope and expectation that that other person is going to meet their needs. And when they don't, problems begin to develop in the marriage. Now, it seems that when we're born into the world, we are born with certain needs or desires. And God has planned that He alone can meet those needs and desires. He alone can be to us what we need Him to be at the deepest essence of our lives. But because we do not turn to Him, because we do not respond to His invitation to come to Him, we then begin to try to find substitutes by which those desires or those needs can be met and we turn to other things or to other people. And I think that basically those desires, those needs are threefold. First of all, there is a desire for satisfaction. We have, I believe, a basic need to live satisfying lives, to live lives that are fulfilling, but God never intended that we should find our fulfillment in another person or something else outside of himself. But if we're not finding a satisfying life in relationship to God, then we begin to look to other people. We begin to look to other things. We begin to look to work or occupations to somehow satisfy the deepest desires of our heart. And of course, we find that they don't satisfy because they are substitutes for a right relationship to God. And if we're doing this in marriage, then we begin to try and manipulate each other. We start giving in order to get something to meet this deep need in our lives, and we find it doesn't work. There's another basic need, the need for, for significance, that we are born with a sense uh, that we want to seek an identity. We want to be recognized as something other than part of the mass of humanity. We're not just a name in the telephone book. We're not just a, a number, but somehow we are someone in our own right. We have an identity that somehow we count. This is why children oftentimes, when they're little, if they don't receive uh, proper attention, 
and proper discipline, begin to show off, begin to do things in order to get attention. And when we give it to them, when they're showing off, then they do it even more. And sometimes they grow up uh, and find more bizarre ways of behaving in order to get somebody's attention, even if it's only the police. But there's that desire to have significance, to live a significant life, to be a significant person. And it's really the attempt to establish our identity in relationship to someone other than God and how they treat us. And there are people who really go into marriage because they think that if this person will think enough of me to marry me, then I must be special. I must be important. I must be significant. I used to work with a, a journeyman electrician who would sing occasionally while he was working. And I remember a song he used to sing. And he would sing this song, And when I tell them, and I'm certainly going to tell them, that out of this whole world, you've gone and you've chosen me, they'll never believe me. And there are people who get married for that reason. You've made me significant. You've made me feel like a person. You make me feel special, and that's why I'm marrying you. The problem is, we get into marriage, and after a while, they don't seem to think we're so special anymore. They don't seem to give us as much attention as we thought. In fact, sometimes they seem disappointed in us. And so we feel threatened. We feel we've lost something. We aren't that knight in shining armor that our husband, our wives thought we might be. We don't seem to be as important uh, to him or to her anymore. He doesn't open the car door when, like, as he did when, he was, when we were courting. He forgets to bring the flowers or the chocolates, and he doesn't say, I love you very much. And so we begin to feel, well, maybe I'm not as important to him or to her as I thought. Maybe I'm not as significant. And of course, sometimes that can lead to affairs because maybe the secretary thinks you're wonderful at work or the boss begins to pay some attention and, and you begin to think, aha, now I can find significance. Now I'm finding my identity. This is a better relationship. And so problems begin to develop because we've really tried to find an identity apart from God and being his children and loved by him, made in his image and one for whom Jesus died to restore us back to himself. Of course, there's another problem that can develop out of a need for security. A need to sense that in a world that is very insecure, a world when we're not sure what's going to happen to the world in general, ourselves in particular, we're not sure if we're going to have a job tomorrow, we're not going to sure, be sure if our health will remain uh, as it is, or, or whether uh, our husband will be able to take care of us, or our wife will be there to look after us. And so there's a great deal of insecurity around us. And some people marry thinking, if I can only be married, this person will, will look after me now and they'll take care of me in my old age. They'll provide a nice home and we'll have a nice family and things will be good. And they'll go on loving me and taking care of me and it'll be a nice, secure relationship. And we find when we get married, it isn't quite as secure as we thought. He's maybe not as capable as we thought he, he was going to be. He isn't able to bring in as much of a salary as we anticipated. We haven't been able to get that house that we thought and the car isn't as new as the one we anticipated getting and maybe the health isn't as good as we anticipated and so security becomes an issue and because we're not really resting in god and knowing the father's love and care for us we find sometimes that we're frustrated and disappointed god never intended that these deep human needs would be met by anyone else but himself. And when we go into the marriage relationship looking to that other person to meet these needs, then we begin to develop some serious problems because that person is not able to meet the needs that God alone can. And we begin to be unhappy with them. We get into arguments. We get into quarrels. We begin to look to other things to meet those needs. We don't spend much time together. We don't talk a great deal. We don't enjoy being together. That person isn't providing what we thought they were going to provide because we're not looking to God and finding in God our security, our significance, and our satisfaction, and out of that then free to bless and love and enjoy one another 
We're living, as we said before, like vacuum cleaners or sponges, trying to draw security, trying to draw significance, trying to draw satisfaction from the other person. And sometimes we draw all the life out of them until there's nothing left in them, and we discard them and go on to something else. It's one of the reasons we have a skyrocketing divorce rate in our country. But it may be true for many of us also. We're really not finding our life in Jesus, so we're trying to find it in each other, and it's not a happy relationship. And so counterfeit marriages are counterfeit because the reasons for marrying are wrong. The other thing we would say is they are counterfeit because the resources for marriage are wanting. The reasons are wrong, and they don't have the resources necessary to have the kind of marriage God wants them to have. These marriages are seriously deficient because they don't have what it takes for two people to live together successfully. They may start out with great promise. Maybe take, wedding takes place in the church, and it's a beautiful wedding, and everything seems so promising. Maybe a handsome couple, and the future seems bright. But because they do not have the resources necessary to, rest, to uh, maintain the relationship and to allow the relationship to grow and develop, soon prom problems begin to uh, come along, and they don't have God's provision to sustain them. Sometimes the reason for that is that the, the relationship is built on philia, the Greek word for love, one of the Greek words for love, which is philia, which is based on emotional attraction. We enjoy each other. We have had some fun together. And we think if we get married, we could go on having this fun together and, and be emotionally attracted to one another and satisfying to one another. But this kind of relationship is always threatened because the person may not be able to keep supplying what you think you need. Or you may find someone else more emotionally attracting, somebody else a little more intelligent, somebody else's personality who's a little more scintillating somebody who can tell funnier jokes or who can keep you amused a little longer, someone else whose personality is more attractive to you. And so the other person can't compete because the relationship is built not on the kind of love God wants, but simply on emotional attraction. Or it might be built on eros. That's simply physical attraction. That I married you because you were so handsome. And I thought, if I married a handsome guy like this, people would think, something of me and there's something special about me and surely with a good-looking fellow like this we could have a wonderful marriage or a beautiful girl very attractive and so we get married just simply on a physical basis and then we find that it won't sustain the relationship she doesn't look quite as beautiful when her makeup isn't on and her hair is in curlers she doesn't he doesn't look quite so handsome when he isn't shaved and and his eyes are full of sleep and or he has got the flu or whatever and and he gains a few pounds, and he isn't quite as, as athletic as you thought he was going to be, or the wife has the children, and you come home, and, and she's been taking care of kids all day, and she doesn't look like the, the total woman. Uh, and so we begin to say, you know, maybe there's something missing here. She can't think up a new out outfit for every night. And we begin to think that the problem is my wife if she'd only fix herself up, this would be a better marriage. If she'd just get her hair done and use a little bit of makeup and get some new dresses and a more attractive nightgown or something, then this marriage would really have something to it. No, it won't. No, it won't. That will last for a little while, but it doesn't, doesn't sustain. You can't keep it up. Life isn't like that. You can't live on dessert all the time. And so we find that because we're living for the wrong reasons, we're living out of the wrong kind of love, then problems begin to develop because God intends that we not live on the basis of philia or eros, but on the basis of agape. This is God's love. It's love that's marked by commitment and self-sacrifice. Now, some people might say, is there something wrong with, with philia, with emotional attraction? Is there something wrong with eros? No. There's nothing wrong with either one of those. But they were never intended by God to be the foundation of a relationship. They're the means by which we become conscious of each other. They're the means by which we communicate with each other. But they were never intended by God to be the basis of our commitment to one another. 
Our commitment is to be based on agape, self-giving, self-sacrificing love, and philia and eros are means by which we communicate that love. But they can never be the basis for that love. If they are, cracks soon begin to appear in the foundation because it's not strong enough to sustain an ongoing relationship the way God wants it to be. And so we find that counterfeit marriages simply cannot become what God intends they should become because the reasons were wrong. And if you're having problems in your marriage, I suggest you sit down and ask yourself some questions. Why did we get married? Why did I marry my wife? Why did I marry my husband? And you may find that you, find that you married for all the wrong reasons. You married simply out of selfishness, thinking, here's the person that will satisfy my life, meet my needs, and they haven't. And so you're disappointed. You're rejecting that person. You're looking to other things or to other people. Or you may find also that the resources are not there. You don't have the quality of life and the quality of love that God wants you to have to have the kind of relationship he intended for you when you got married. You're living on the wrong basis. And so you have a counterfeit relationship. What does God want? God wants covenanters. Those who enter into marriage on the basis of covenant. They're not counterfeiters, but they're covenanters. Those who marry for love. In Malachi 2.14, God speaks about the covenant of marriage. We live in an age in which contracts are constantly being renegotiated. And it's very important for us to understand that the Christian marriage is not entered into on the basis of a social contract. That Christian marriages are not based on social contracts which is dependent or which are dependent upon each fulfilling the obligations of the contract. And if one or the other fails to fulfill the contract, then we're free somehow to either renegotiate it or to simply void it completely. Christian marriages and all marriages were intended by God to be based on a covenant made with God, a covenant uh, that promises faithfulness within our human limitations and which is dependent upon God to supply the strength to sustain the commitment and the ability to maintain the relationship. A marriage, a Christian marriage, is based on covenant in which we commit ourselves before God to one another, to love one another, till death do us part. That's the kind of commitment God calls for, and he promises to those who enter into covenant before him and before each other and before witnesses that he will give them the necessary resources to sustain that in spite of the limitations of our humanness, that he will provide what is necessary to stay together throughout the difficulties and the problems of life and to grow together and to learn how to love one another so that we will go on loving one another throughout all eternity. That's the will of God, based upon covenant. Now, covenant means certain things. Covenant, first of all, means a commitment to God's will. When we enter into covenant, in the covenant of marriage, we recognize that marriage is more than an agreement between two people. God is party to the marriage covenant. When you and I stood and made covenant with our wives, with our husbands. God was present. He was right there. There, were not, there are not two people who make the covenant. There are three. There is the husband, there's the wife, and there is God. And we, God is party to it. And when you go through the, the Old Testament and into the New Testament, you find that God, the normal relationship between God and his people is based upon covenant relationship. And that covenant relationship between God and his people is to be the norm for the marriage relationship. And notice how God lives in covenant with us. The word kesed, the Hebrew word that refers to covenant, means covenant love, loving kindness, committed love. 
It is a stable and solid thing that God does not allow even gross sins to destroy. God will not allow gross sins on the part of his people to destroy his love for the sinner or annul his covenant promises to the one who seeks forgiveness. God says, I enter into covenant with you. I love you. I will never cease to love you. I will always love you. And I live in a relationship to you of love in which I am willing to forgive even the grossest of sins should you seek my forgiveness. Nothing can break my covenant love for you. And God calls you and me in marriage into covenant love, not into a contract based upon what each may do for the other, but into covenant, which is a commitment to love each other, even when one falls in to the deepest of sin. Now you might say, that's a pretty heavy obligation. But the great promise of the new covenant is this, I will put my spirit within you. And he gives the spirit to those who obey him. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by his spirit. Only the love of God flooding our hearts can enable us to live out that kind of covenant love. But that's what he promises us. That's the basis of the new covenant. And God calls us to that. And in covenant love, God gives us the gift of marriage. And this is why we receive from each other God's gift. Have you ever received your wife or your husband as a gift of God to you in a covenant marriage relationship? If you haven't, then you need to. Your husband, your wife within the covenant of marriage is a gift of God to you. And you need to thank him for that gift. The marriage covenant is not based upon what we promise to do for each other, but on the promises of God, affirming what he will do in each of us for the other and for all mankind. I want to say that again, that the marriage covenant is not based upon what we promise to do for each other, but on the promises of God, affirming what he will do in each of us for the other and for all mankind. Those of us who are married again, we need to say, Lord, do in me what is necessary to be done in order that you can do through me what you want to do for my partner, for my wife, for my husband. Marriage is a self-giving, sacrificing relationship. And I would say to those of us in marriage and those of you contemplating marriage that satisfaction is not guaranteed in marriage, but sacrifice is. And it is out of that sacrificing commitment to one another to enable one another to be all that God intended we should be that God's love begins to flow. And there is a joy and there is an expectation and there is an excitement that comes when you commit yourself in covenant relationship to receive each other as from God and to live with each other by the grace of God. Nothing else will satisfy the relationship. Nothing else will make it what God wants it to be. God calls us to covenant love. Notice what we say in the marriage ceremony. And for those of us who are married, I want you to listen to what you promised when you married your wife, when you married your husband. For those of you who are thinking about marriage, I want you to think about this section from the marriage ceremony and realize what is being said, what you have said, what you may say. I take thee to be my wedded wife, or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, till death us do part, and thereto I pledge thee my faith. I take thee to be my wedded wife or husband, to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse. Whether you live up to my expectations or fall far short of them. For richer, whether you're able to supply the things that I hope we can have. For poorer, whether we have very little of anything. In sickness, I covenant to love you 
in sickness. I will love you when you are healthy. I will love you when you are ill. If you suffer a crippling illness, I will never forsake you. If I must carry you, bathe you, feed you till you die, I will do so. I will never forsake you. When you are young and beautiful and attractive or handsome, I love you. When you become older, when you're not seemingly as attractive as you are now, I will still love you. I will love you now as you are slender. I will love you if you're overweight. I will love you as a young person. I will love you as an old person. I will love you as an athlete. I will love you as a crippled person, a handicapped person. I will always love you. I will love you if you are all and more that I hope that you can be. I will love you even if you disappoint me. I will never cease to love you. I will love you if we live in a mansion. I will love you if we live in a tent. That's covenant love. I don't make that up. That's what it says. That's what we confessed before God. Have we been faithful to that? In covenant love, what we say is that we will be faithful to each other in all kinds of circumstances. That nothing will be allowed to happen to us that will break the bond of covenant. This is the kind of love that God calls us to. That's why he not only gives us the gift of marriage, but he gives us grace for marriage. And the grace of God for marriage is the resources necessary to give marriage quality and durability. This kind of marriage is not possible apart from the grace of God. This kind of marriage can only happen as we live in dependence upon God and allow his spirit in the new covenant to fill our lives so that we begin to learn how to love as God loves. To live in relationship to someone as God lives in relationship or wants to live in relationship to them. I remember going through some struggles and, and thinking about this whole matter of marriage and divorce and, and when is divorce le legitimate or not legitimate. And there was a very intense and personal struggle as a pastor and thinking it through. And the thing that the Holy Spirit began to show me was to back away from just the question of divorce or marriage, but to back up into the character of God and how does God relate to me and to people. And I saw that God is love. And that God is willing to forgive me no matter how far into sin I have gone. And that God seeks me in his love. He does not coerce me, but nevertheless, he has still loves me and still seeks me, even in my sin and in the depths of my sin. And that when I turned from my sin to him, he was there in mercy and willingness to receive me and forgive me and restore me to himself. And I came to the conclusion that I could never encourage a Christian to divorce. That even in the midst of a difficult, horrendous marriage situation, I could still say, I believe God wants you to remain faithful in that circumstance. Not trusting in yourself, but trusting in the grace that God can give you to reflect into that situation God's love. To bring into that situ situation hope of redemption. Not because of what you're able to do, but because of what God has done in your life. Because he's a God of covenant love. It's not an easy calling. But I believe that God, by his grace, is able to sustain and to redeem that situation. And to give the grace to suffer, even when suffering is called for. God calls us to covenant love. To be covenanters, not counterfeiters. Those who realize that we have made a covenant before our God. And that God graciously not only stood with us on the day in which we were married, but he has never left us. And he is there with us to be to us all that we need him to be. But many of us are looking to other things. 
We're looking to our work, we're looking to our children, we're looking to our husbands, our wives, our homes, finances for significance. We're trying to be something somehow. We're not finding it in the other person, and so we're looking to other things. We're looking to, for someone else, for security, for significance, for satisfaction. And God says, I alone can be to you those things. I want to be. I am the God who's enough. I am El Shaddai. Allow me to be to you what I want to be. And then allow me to be through you what I want to be to your partner. That in your love for them, they can begin to see who they really are. They can find their real significance because of my love for them. They can find their real security because I'm your father and I care for you, and I count the very hairs of your head. And not even a sparrow can fall to the ground, but I'm aware of it. Are you not of much more value than a sparrow? That you can find your satisfaction in knowing me and being loved by me and living for my glory. God is looking for covenant love in us by his Spirit as we commit ourselves to being covenanters not counterfeiters. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning that you call to us, you, you bring us to a high calling in marriage. But Lord, just as you've promised grace for singleness, that's a high calling too. So when you call us into the, the gift of marriage, you promise the grace necessary there. Father, we would confess that many of us, maybe all of us, have made mistakes We've really not loved each other as we should have. But we thank you that living in relationship to you, there is forgiveness, there is restoration. And that beginning today, Lord, we can receive our husbands, our wives as gifts from you. We can receive the gift of your Holy Spirit and the fullness of your love into our hearts. We can begin to learn to live the way you want us to. We can begin to care for one another. We can begin to seek to serve each other. You're a God of redemption. And you can restore what we've lost. And so we thank you for that. Thank you for your goodness and love and your grace. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.